Introduction The struggle for freedom began in 1775 and lasted for eight long years before it ended in 1783. In the struggle of the colonies against the British, the 13 colonies on the Atlantic seaboard of North America acquired their independence from Great Britain and became United States. The Great Revolution is also known as the American War of Independence. The American Revolution brought an end to the two-century-long British rule for most of the colonies in North America shaped the present United States of America. The radical epoch was both disturbing and accelerating, a time of evolution for some, disruption for others. In the rouse of the revolution came events as diverse as the drafting and endorsement of the Constitution of the United States of America and the revolts of slaves who saw the disparity between captivity and declarations of liberty. What were the ideologies that the American mutineers battled for? The most common one was sovereignty. The American loyalists believe that all governments exist to benefit all the people. Whenever a government sullied the fundamental rights of the people, they had the right to coop or change it. The other simple principle was equality before the law. During times when people in the Western world were mostly governed by kings, the American patriots renounced the idea that the people ought to be royal subjects. Instead, they asserted that the people should be viewed as residents with equivalent rights, including the right to partake in government matters. A third essential principle was rule of law and constitutional rights. The American rebels believed in natural rights. The notion that the public have some fundamental rights that should be safeguarded against dictatorial coercion, including the right to hearing by jury, freedom from capricious arrest and penalty and freedom of speech and integrity. They also believed in constitutionalism, that the people's rights and government's powers and functions required to be documented. Chapter 1 Causes of the American War of Independence Earlier, all seemed to be fine and the colonies were proud to be British. Besides a few occurrences of Parliament's control which troubled the colonists, like the Currency Acts of 1751 and 1764. But it was when the French and Indian War took place in 1754, lasting till 1763, that King George III incurred heavy losses in buying provisions for his army and the colonies. To pay off his debts, he enforced taxes on the colonies without their consent, causing an outrage amid the colonists. An old saying goes that you must look out for the money trail. The Protestant Reformation had something similar, and money was undoubtedly one of the chief reasons of the American Revolution. The idea of paying taxes was not something the Americans liked because earlier they always got the goods without taxes. They instantly began to shun British goods. This apparently infuriated the king who lost no time in sending his army across the Atlantic to ensure that the colonies were at their best behaviour. Besides, there were hundreds of reasons why the Americans rose to mutiny. The British had implemented the policy of mercantilism. The system was built on the benefits of lucrative trading. The colonies were asked to source products which would otherwise have to be got from non-imperial sources, make the finished products themselves, generate exports and then sell these products outside the country. There was a centralised control of the economy. The trade was confined and there was a list of goods which could not be exported to European ports, except for England. The triangular trade routes were made and Americans had to trade products which they had in surplus, in exchange for products that were less in their own area. Triangular trade, together with the British policy of mercantilism, delivered a positive balance of trade, profiting only Great Britain. It guaranteed that all precious metals and domestic credit remained in England. The Navigation Acts were intended to control colonial trade. 
The Navigation Act was to boost British shipping and permit Great Britain to hold the domination of British colonial trade for the sole benefit of British merchants. In 1689, English Bill of Rights stated that all the liberties and rights of an individual were protected by the English law. Americans debated that they were not judged the same rights. In 1696, the British adopted the policy of salutary neglect, evading the strict enforcement of parliamentary laws in colonial America that gave the colonies substantial liberty in economic matters. Amid 1763 to 1775, the British tried to inverse their policy of salutary neglect to constrict their control in the colonies, pay for war debts, impose the Navigation Acts and other rules, and execute new taxes on products. The Wool Act passed in 1699 by the British Parliament stated that the Americans could not export cloth made in their colonies. In 1732, the Hat Act prevented the Americans to trade their manufactured hats. A debt recovery passed in 1732 pronounced that slaves and land were equal to property and should be sold to realise debts owned by the colonial residents to British merchants. Heavy taxes were imposed on sugar in 1733 through Molasses or Navigation Act. The Iron Act passed in 1750 suppressed the production of Finnish products in the colonies and the production and export of iron was done to Great Britain only. An edict imposed on October 7, 1763 prohibited private citizens and colonial governments to buy land or make any contracts with natives. Only the British Empire would have all official relations. Additionally, only traders who were licensed would be permitted to travel west or have any dealings with the native Indians. The Americans thought the British were siding with the native Indians against the colonies. The British issued a Sugar Act or the American Revenue Act in 1764 as the taxes from 1733 Mullis's Act was not collected efficiently. The 1764 Act instated tax on molasses and sugar imported in the colonies, which heavily impacted the rum business in New England. In the Boston boycott of August 1764, the traders and women of Boston refused to buy any British clothing like satin, ruffles and laces. On September 1, 1764, the Currency Act was passed, regulating depreciated paper currency of the colonies, which was used to pay the British traders and creditors. Stamp Act was passed on March 22, 1765, in which taxes were levied on newspapers, legal papers and pamphlets. Mayhem broke, which forced the British to annual the Act in 1766. Quartering Act of 1765 stated that the British troops were to be housed in the barracks provided by the colonies. If the barracks were too small, then they should occupy the lodges and inns, and if there were no place for them still, the public houses were to be occupied. The Americans disliked the idea of British soldiers living amidst them, and they refused to comply with the Act. In May 1765, Patrick Henry was elected as a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. He headed the disapproval against the loathed British laws and taxes in the House of Burgesses. In March 1766, the British took steps against the Americans by issuing the Declaratory Act that stated the British right to make laws compulsory on the colonies. On June 29, 1767, some laws called the Townshand Acts added taxes on items that are imported by the colonists, including lead, paints, glass, tea and paper. The levying of taxes seemed to be endless, and yet another Townshand Act was passed imposing taxes on imported goods by the colonies like paint, paper, glass, tea lead, etc. October 1, 1768, saw two British warships sail into Boston Harbour, leaving behind two regiments of English troops to keep law and order. 
Boston Massacre, also known as the Incident on King Street, on March the 5th, 1770, British soldiers killed five civilians and injured six others. It was the result of a revolt when eight British soldiers barged into the revolting crowd without orders. The Tea Act of May the 10th, 1773, permitted the British East India Company to sell the low-priced tea to the colonies directly, discouraging the local colonial tea merchants. A protest by the Sons of Liberty, organization created by the colonists, in Boston, when they dressed as Native Americans and destroyed a whole ship of East India Company carrying tea, they threw chests of tea into the sea on December the 16th, 1773. It is an iconic event in the history of American Revolution. The British passed a series of laws that were known as intolerable acts in retaliation to the Boston Tea Party Rebellion. The five laws aimed at punishing Massachusetts for their revolt, Boston, and to reinstate British authority in the American colonies. The intolerable acts were Boston Port Act, Massachusetts Government Act, Administration of Justice Act, Quartering Act, Quebec Act. Between September the 5th, 1774 and October 26th, 1774, the First Continental Congress met in and the elected representatives of colonists assembled in uprising against the British rule. The Continental Association was created by the Continental Congress in 1774 in an answer to the intolerable acts and to enforce economic authorizations against Great Britain. The Articles of Association were adopted on October 20, 1774. The Association was powerful and its continuous revolts gave fire to the American Revolution. Their trade with Great Britain fell speedily. It was on March 23, 1775, when Patrick Henry gave his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, referring to the warlike preparations of the British Army and sounding crucial call to arms, and sounding crucial call to arms, saying, The war is inevitable and let it come. On Wednesday, April 19, 1775, the Battle of Lexington and the Battle of Concord started the American Revolution. Round 700 British Army patrons in Boston, under Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith, were giving surreptitious orders to arrest and end rebellious military provisions, all edgedly stored by the Massachusetts militia at Concord. However, the colonial loyalists had received the news weeks before the mission that their provisions might be at risk and had relocated most of it to other places. They also got the details of the plans of the British a night before the war and were able to quickly inform the area militias about the British mission. The first gun shoots were fired just as the sun was rising at Lexington. The Second Continental Congress issued the declaration on the causes and necessity of taking up arms on July the 6th, 1775, to explain why the 13 colonies had taken up arms and marked the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. They determined to die free men, then live their lives as slaves. Chapter 2 Independence and Union the North Carolina Provincial Congress issued the Halifax Resolves on April 1776, openly permitting its representatives to vote for independence. Congress asked all the states to write constitutions and remove the last fragments of British rule in May the same year. By June, nine colonies were prepared for independence. Slowly the remaining four, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York and Maryland also lined up. Richard Henry Lee was asked by the Virginia legislature to propose independence, which he did on June the 7th, 1776. On the June 11th, 1776, a committee was formed to draw a document asking for justifications to be separated from Great Britain. After safeguarding sufficient votes for clearance, independence was voted for on July the 2nd. The Declaration of Independence was drafted mainly by Thomas Jefferson and presented by the committee, which was slightly re-read and universally accepted by the entire Congress on July the 4th. 
This marked the foundation of a new sovereign nation that was called the United States of America. The Second Continental Congress sanctioned a new constitution, the Articles of Confederation, for approval by the states on November 15, 1777, and instantly began functioning under their terms. The Articles were formally endorsed on March 1, 1781, and the Continental Congress was dissolved and was replaced by a new government of the United States of America in Congress assembled with Samuel Huntington as the presiding officer. Chapter 3 Protecting the Revolution It seemed that the Royal Army did not want to let go of their reign so easily. They tried to take over their rule between 1776 to 1777. British Return 1776 to 1777 As per the British historian Jeremy Black, the British had substantial leads with the world's largest navy, exceedingly trained army, and an extremely competent system of public finance which could effortlessly fund the war. But the British were utterly handicapped and misinterpreted the complexity of backing for the patriot position. Disregarding the guidance of General Gage, they misjudged the situation to simply be a big revolt. London thought by directing a big military and naval force, they could subdue the Americans and force them to loyalty. Convinced that the revolution was the work of some troublemakers who had united an armed mob to their cause, they anticipated that the rebels would be daunted. Then the massive majority of Americans, who were loyal but scared by the terroristic strategies, would upsurge and kick out the protesters and reinstate a loyal government in every colony. When Washington forced the British Army out of Boston in 1776, neither the Army's loyalists nor British controlled any important areas. Nonetheless, the British were gathering armies at their marine base at Nova Scotia, Halifax. They returned with forces in July 1776, arriving in New York and overpowering Washington's Continental Army at the Battle of Brooklyn. After they won the Battle of Brooklyn, the British entreated a meeting with councils from Congress to discuss an end to conflicts. John Adams and Benjamin Franklin and some other delegates met Howe on Staten Island in New York Harbour on September the 11th, which came to be known as the Staten Island Peace Conference. Howe necessitated a withdrawal of the Declaration of Independence, which was denied, ending all discussions. The British then hastily clutched New York City and almost captured Washington's army. They made New York their political and military hub of operations in North America till November 1783. The city became a terminus for loyalist refugees and a principal point of Washington's intellect network. The British also seized New Jersey, driving the Continental Army to Pennsylvania. In 1776, the British Army was taken by a surprise attack when Washington defeated Hessian and British regiments at Princeton and Trenton, thus retrieving control over most parts of New Jersey. The victory was a lift to the fading morale of the Patriots. The British strategized again in 1777 and to end the war they sent their forces from Canada to block New England, which the British professed as main source of campaigners. However, there was a big misunderstanding and the army went to Philadelphia. The army was headed by Burgoyne, who hopelessly waited for reinforcements from New York and was trapped in northern New York. They lay down their arms after the Battle of Saratoga in October 1777. There was a crucial siege in Philadelphia at Fort Mifflin, Pennsylvania, between October 1777 to November 1777, diverting British troops and giving Washington time to save the Continental Army and securely lead his army to severe winter housings at Valley Forge. American Alliances 1778. 
the imprisonment of British forces at Saratoga fortified the French to officially enter the war in support of Congress, as Benjamin Franklin discussed, and enduring military alliance in early 1778, knowingly becoming the first country to formally recognize the Declaration of Independence. On February the 6th, 1778, a Treaty of Alliance and Treaty of Amity and Commerce was signed between France and United States of America. William Pitt tried to initiate the British on making peace with Americans and join hands with America against France, while other British politicians who were sympathetic towards the American colonial grievances were now against Americans for associating with Britain's enemy. By 1780, France had two more allies. Dutch and the Spain singling the British Empire to battle a war alone. The American theatre thus became only one front in Britain's war. The British were forced to pull out their armies from continental America to support Caribbean colonies who produced sugar, which was far more important than this. The French coalition and declining military conditions forced Sir Henry Clinton to vacate Philadelphia to strengthen New York City. Washington's attempt to stop the retreating army resulted in the Battle of Monmouth Court House. It was the last big clash between Americans and the British. After an indecisive battle, the British successfully withdrew to New York City. The Northern War consequently became an impasse as the attention moved to the smaller South and theatre. The British Flee South, 1778-1783 the British approach in America now focused on an operation in the South. With lesser steady regiments at their disposal, the British commanders thought that the Southern strategy was a more feasible plan, as the South was apparently more strong loyalist, with a huge population of fresh migrants and a large number of slaves who would be seized or run away to join Britain. Late in December 1778, the British army took Savannah and took control of a Georgia coastline. In 1780, they hurled a new attack and grabbed Charleston too. A momentous conquest at the Battle of Camden meant that British armies soon controlled most of South Carolina and Georgia. The Royal Army laid up a network of internal forts, expecting the Loyalists to assemble to the flag. Very few Loyalists turned up and the British Army had to fight their way to Virginia and North Carolina with a terribly weak army. Their captured territories were fought over by the Loyalists and American militia, reversing all the British gains made in those territories. The British finally surrender. 1781 The Battle of Yorktown, or German Battle, or the Siege of Yorktown, and most famously remembered as the Surrender of Yorktown, was on October 19, 1781, when combined forces of American Continental Army and French Army troops, led by General George Washington and Comte de Rochambeau, respectively were victorious in a battle against the British Army commanded by Lieutenant General Charles Cornwallis. The siege was the biggest land battle fought in the American Revolution War of Independence, which concluded the Yorktown movement with the surrender and capture of General Cornwallis and his army, provoking the British government to negotiate and end the battle. The battle upped the hesitating morale of the Americans and invigorated the French fervour for the war, as well as sabotaging the support for battle in Great Britain. France sent 500 soldiers to Rhode Island in 1780 to support their American allies in the campaign against the British in New York City. There were more fleets dispatched from France, which also had the support of French West Indies fleet of Comte de Grasse. Rochambeau and George Washington requested Grasse to aid them in besieging New York or against a British campaign in Virginia. Cornwallis was ordered to build a defensive water port in Yorktown, but the Continental Army, led by Lafayette, shadowed his actions. In the summer of 1781, American and French armies waited united in North New York City for Grass's orders, and they finally moved south to Virginia, engaging in illusory tricks, leading the British to believe that the New York siege was strategic. De Grasse, 
brought additional soldiers to Chesapeake Bay in the end of August and made a naval cordon of Yorktown. De Grasse was carrying 500,000 silver pesos the Cuban citizen had collected to fund the siege and pay the Continental Army. Back in Santo Domingo, Grasse met representative of Carlos III of Spain, Francisco Saavedra de Sangronis, who assured that Spanish navy would assist the French merchant fleet and help him sail north with his warships. Grass defeated Sir Thomas Graves' British fleet in early September, who came to release Cornwallis at Chesapeake Battle. He blocked all ways for Cornwallis and his army. Rochambeau and Washington arrived by the end of September and had Cornwallis entirely fenced. The British defence weakened once the French and American armies started barrage and on October 14, 1781, two columns sent by Washington attacked what was remaining of the British defences. The French and Americans took one redoubt each, worsening the British speedily and finally on October 17, 1781, Cornwallis requested for capitulation. The surrender ceremony took place two days later, when more than 7,000 British soldiers were captured. Cornwallis was absent in this ceremony, stating he was ill. Once the discussion started, it resulted in the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Chapter 4 And it finally ends. There is a long debate among the historians whether the odds for the victory of America were short or long. John E. Ferling believes the odds were so long that the victory for Americans was a miracle, whereas Joseph L. debates the odds were in the favour of Americans and questions if there was ever a realistic opportunity for the British to win. He disputes that they had the prospect once, in 1776, and the Howe brothers missed several occasions to abolish the Continental Army. There were, of course, other factors, such as luck, chance and whims of weather. His point is that the house were disastrously flawed as they underrated the challenges faced by patriots. Back in Britain, there were many who always commiserated with the colonial rebels. King George wanted to continue the war, but he did not get any financial help from the Parliament. The Parliament of Great Britain had never expected the war to last so long. They had already raised the taxes exceedingly high to pay for the war. The English Parliament was also concerned about the colonies' association with the French. It would affect their trade with America, which was quite lucrative for the British. In March 1782, the Parliament said all those who advised or attempted any further action of belligerent conflict on North America would be considered to be the enemies to His Majesty and the country. Washington was not convinced that Yorktown would be the end of the war. It was only when he saw General Sir Guy Callaton move out with his troops assured him that the war had come to an end. In the summer of 1782, the representatives of the colonies, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams and John Jay, negotiated with the English ambassadors in Paris. Both parties reached to an agreement and how it was the turn of the British envoys to enlighten King George III. The English also had to make peace with the Spanish and the French before the pact could be signed. In February 1783, George III eventually gave his proclamation of cessation of hostilities that opened the gates for a peace treaty among English and the American colonies. Benjamin Franklin and John Jay signed the Paris Peace Treaty on September 3, 1783, in Paris. The treaty documented the United States of America as an independent government, laid borders of the new United States of America, the Atlantic Ocean on the east, the Mississippi River on the west, Great Lakes on the north and Florida on the south, stated that people from Britain, Spain, Holland, France and the United States had rights to the Mississippi River, affirmed fishing rights off the new found land coast, gave back the property and rights to the loyalists who wished to stay back in the colonies, recognised rules for the exclusion of British forces which were in America and returned Senegal to France and Florida to Spain. Britain lost a lot of terrain because of the peace treaty. 
British forces left New York City in November 1783 and the Continental Army finally parted. Washington left for his home in Mount Vernon and intended to retire by working on his plantation. The Continental Congress was now the Constitutional Congress and the participants began to draft the Bill of Rights and Constitution of the United States of America. Chapter 5 Impact of War on Great Britain and Finances of the Countries in the Revolution Losing the thirteen American colonies and the battle came as a great shock to Britain. The battle exposed the boundaries of Britain's fiscal military state when it was powerful enemies on its face with no associates and reliant on protracted and susceptible transatlantic lines of communication. The defeat intensified opposition and spiraled political resentment to the ministers of the king. Within the parliament, the main problem changed from fears of a mighty ruler to the issues of representation, government cutback and parliamentary alteration. Reformers pursued to finish what they saw as pervasive institutional corruption. The outcome was a great crisis from 1776 to 1783. The treaty in 1783 left France financially drained, whereas the British economy flourished with the return of American business. The crunch ended after 1784 because of the King's astuteness in outsmarting Charles James Fox, the leader of the Fox North Coalition, and rehabilitated assurance in the system provoked by the headship of William Pitt, the new Prime Minister. Historians say that the loss of the American colonies facilitated the British to handle the French Revolution in a more organised and harmonious way. Britain took course to Asia, the Pacific and later on Africa with ensuing exploration leading to the upsurge of the Second British Empire. Finance Their war against the French, Americans and the Spanish cost the British dearly which amounted to around one hundred million pounds. Chunks of money just vanished against the funding of war and brought France on the brink of being bankrupt and revolt in comparison to Britain, who was in a less problematic situation in maintaining and hiring soldiers. Britain had an urbane monetary system grounded on the fortune of many of landowners, who sustained the government collectively with finances and banks in London. The competent British tax system gathered about 12% of the GDP in the form of taxes in the 1770s. In contrast, the Congress and the American states had no finish to the hitches of financing the war. In 1775, there was around $12 million in gold in the colonies, which was not sufficient for the present transactions, leave alone funding a huge war. The British worsened the situations by blocking every American port, cutting off almost all its exports and imports, making them dependent on donations from citizens and militiamen. The actual payments of the soldiers were delayed and the suppliers and soldiers were paid in depreciated currency, with promises to be paid well in land grants against the wages they earned. The weak system continued till the government had a strong financial leader in the form of Robert Morris, who was made Superintendent of Finance of the United States of America in 1781. In 1782, Morris used a French loan and set up the private bank of North America to fund the rebel. Looking for more competence, Morris condensed the civil list and saved money by reasonable bits for contracts, stiffened bookkeeping system and necessitated that the national governments give them full portion of supplies and money from the allied states. The Congress mainly used four ways to cover the war cost, about $66 million in gold and silver. They issued paper money twice, the first one went to $242 million. It was supposed to be exchanged for state taxes. The paper holders were later on paid off in 1791 at the rate of one cent per dollar. The steeply rising inflation came down too hard on some people who had fixed incomes, but 90% of the citizens were farmers and were not straight affected by the inflation. Borrowers profited by clearing their debts with depreciated paper money. 
the heaviest burden was tolerated by the soldiers of the Continental Army, whose wages normally came in arrears and waned in value month after month, flagging their morale and adding to the adversities of their families. In 1777, Congress continuously requested the states to give money, but they did not have a proper taxation system in place either and were of no help. By 1780, Congress was making explicit demands for supplies of beef, corn, pork and other provisions which barely kept the army going. Congress pursued to raise money by credits from prosperous people and promised to convert the bonds after the war in 1776. Congress kept their promise and the bonds were redeemed in 1791 at their face value, but the campaign raised very less money as Americans had little silver and gold and most of the rich merchants supported off the British. In 1776, France covertly gave the Americans money, munitions and gunpowder to weaken Britain, which was its biggest enemy. When France formally joined the war in 1778, the grants continued. The government of France and the bankers in Amsterdam and Paris lent huge amounts towards the American Revolution. The loans were repaid in full by the United States of America in the 1790s. Chapter 6 Concluding the Revolution A Better Union and Guaranteed Rights Once the war finally ended in 1783, there was an era of richness. The national government, still operated under the Articles of Confederation, was able to resolve the problem of the Western territories that were yielded by the states to Congress. American settlers stirred quickly to those areas with Kentucky, Vermont and Tennessee becoming states in the 1790s. The government was neither able to pay back the debts of the war that they owed to the private banks and European nations, not to the Americans who gave millions of dollars of promissory notes to fund the revolution. Alexander Hamilton, George Washington and other experts of the nationalists were afraid that the young nation was too weak to withstand an international war or an internal revolt like the one of 1786 in Massachusetts, Shays' Rebellion. The nationalists renamed themselves Federalists and convinced Congress to summon the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. They embraced a new constitution which delivered a much sturdier federal government which consisted of an operative executive in check and balance system with the legislatures and judiciary. The constitution was approved in 1788 after a fiery debate in the states upon the type of the projected new government. In March 1789, President George Washington took over office under the new government in New York. As guarantees to all who were careful about the federal power, amendments to the Constitution assuring of unchangeable rights which made a basis for the revolt were fronted in Congress by James Madison and later approved by the states in 1791. National Debt After the American Revolution, the national debt was divided in three categories. The first was the $12 million payable to other countries, mostly money taken as loan from France. There was a universal arrangement to pay the external debts at full value. The state government owed around $25 million and national government owed $40 million to American citizens who sold supplies, food and horses to the rebellion forces. There were other debts which comprised of promissory notes given in the revolution to the merchants, farmers, soldiers and farmers who took these payments on the condition that the new constitution would form a government who would ultimately pay off these debts. The expense of war for a state singly added up to around $114 million in comparison to the $37 million by central government. Alexander Hamilton collated all the state debts with the domestic and foreign debts into one massive national debt which added up to $80 million. The national honour of the country was sustained and everybody was redeemed the face value for the certificates issued during the war. Conclusion
Unlike the other revolutions of the world, Americans had already tasted freedom in small parts earlier. This revolution was their yearning to have more than what they already had. The revolution began with insignificant demands which grew during the war and continued its effect after the revolution ended, far beyond the visions of the original revolutionaries. There are many scholars who debate the rise of the revolution, whether or not the Americans would have rebelled had they not been asked to pay taxes without representation. They strongly consider that the revolution was staged against the European feudalism, monarchy, imperialistic wars, established churches, colonialism, mercantilism, the subjugation of the many by the few. The American Revolution was one of its kinds in many respects. It was one of the few states in the world that endured only one revolution. It is also amongst the trivial minority of the states whose ideologies, rebellion and the administration established under it actually lasted. An abrupt modification in the structure of a government implicates a revolt. And the government that succeeded in the late 1700s was very diverse from its English predecessor. The public of America and the people of Great Britain vision authority and thus government in discrete terms. This is because of the speckled understandings and points of view of the American and the English towards their government. In variance to the big revolutions that have marked the 20th century, the American Revolution was successful in achieving what it set out to do, to provide men more freedom than they had possessed earlier. At this time, America has set itself apart from the rest of the countries in the world through many breakthroughs in different industries. Starting from the much wide Silicon Valley to the splendor of the Pentagon, the United States of America is a lot more than what the revolutionaries may have imagined. This only shows the fervor with which America grew since the revolution. There was no stopping and no looking back. Americans have chosen to move ahead in all walks of life and prove that the revolutionaries have created a country that is stronger than ever before. The American Revolution is an example of determination and hope. They set an example for the world in many ways, and America continues to build on the standards set by the revolutionaries as they embrace the many new ways of the world.